This is Duke University. All right. All right. Hello. Welcome Duke University to the Duke Startup Challenge. I'm Bill Warren. I'm one of the co-presidents of the Startup Challenge this year. And I'm Howie Ree. I work at Duke, where I work both at Fuqua and in the Duke i &E Initiative. And together, we're running the Duke Startup Challenge for you tonight. So the Duke Startup Challenge has a long history at Duke University. It's been around for 16 years, and it started in 1999. This is actually a screen capture of the Duke Chronicle article talking about the Duke Startup Challenge. And the winners are pictured here in the bottom right corner, Michael Pollock and Vamsi Pamela. We'll have more on them in a little, a little bit. So I'm going to talk you through a little bit of the history of the Startup Challenge. So in 2002, the first undergraduate-led team won, led by Chuck Easley. So Chuck didn't actually start a company that year, but he ended up going to MIT and Stanford, where he's played a pivotal role talking about the entrepreneurial role in universities. And he credits the Duke Startup Challenge with opening his eyes to entrepreneurship and really altering the direction of his career and, and helping him learn that he could determine his own career. A great success story. In 2006, Precision Biosciences actually took second place. They're actually a going concern. They've raised several million dollars, and they're one of the top ways to edit genes. In 2007, Oncoscope was the winner. Oncoscope is a laser technology that shines down into the esophagus and can tell the difference between cancerous cells and non-cancerous cells without using biopsies. And just to fast forward to a few recent examples of Duke Startup Challenge alums that have done well uh, in the past year. So Andrew First is a Duke Startup Challenge alum who started a company called Lean Plum. And Lean Plum just raised uh, $11.6 million in August for their company. Coinbase is run by a Duke alum named Fred Ursum, who also participated in the Startup Challenge. Fred runs Coinbase, which is the most well-funded Bitcoin company in the world, having just received $75 million in January, on top of $25 million that they received last year. A few more recent examples, Tatiana Bergeson started Mati Energy. She was the winner of our $10,000 prize a few years ago. She's since gone on to do really well with her Mati Energy drink. Anybody a fan of Mati Energy? Let's hear it for her. Yeah. Yes. One of the top sellers in Whole Foods locally. She won $50,000 through the NCI IDEA grant and uh, won $100,000 through the Google for Entrepreneurs Demo Day. Finally, to the last couple teams from last year. So for those of you that were here last year, Crowdtunes was the second place team, a solution for venues to manage their music. They are now live in 150 restaurants, including 20,000 users, and they have four employees. They've done great. And let's be well read, our number one winner last year, uh, Rajvi Mehta is a School of Medicine student who has taken that $50,000 and converted it into producing 150,000 goodness bars every week. Uh, the goodness bar is a, a nutrition supplement for people with iron deficiency in India. She has now 40 employees in India and she's doing really well. They're about to start a clinical trial. And finally, back to the original winning team, Vamsi Pamela and Michael Pollock. They won the first startup challenge. That particular idea didn't work out, but they kept on trying, and they started a company called Advanced Liquid Logic a couple years later. That company was sold for $96 million two years ago, and they have continued on with a new company called Babies. So that's a little bit about the history of the Duke Startup Challenge. All right, so most of the teams that you guys are gonna see here tonight began their journey about a year ago when each team submitted a 15-page idea summary to the Duke Startup Challenge. In this idea summary, they each identified a problem, outlined their vision, and then told us about the company that would make it all happen. In round two, teams had to raise $5,000 on Indiegogo or be advanced purely on the strength of their pitch deck or business plan. The ones that made it each received $5,000 to join the Duke Startup Challenge Summer Incubator, where they could focus on their company, develop their product, and grow. Of course, all of this leads up to today, where we have nine teams competing for a grand prize of $50,000. Yeah. So again, we have nine and I think now 10 teams presenting tonight, which we're all very excited about. Each team will have four minutes to pitch their idea, and then we'll receive one question from our pool of judges. The prizes that we're awarding tonight are a $2,500 audience choice prize awarded by you all, a $2,500 prize awarded by the Duke Angel Network and INE Task Force, 
and members of those two groups will vote for the winner of that prize. And then at the end of the night, the judges who will be sitting to my left will reveal who is the winner of this year's $50,000 Wicket Family Grand Prize. So before we go on, we want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Smith Anderson, The Chronicle, Eye Contact, and Citrix Sharefile. Let's give a round of applause to our sponsors for helping make this work. Yeah, so we're going to take a minute, let our judges get seated, um, transfer here, and then we're going to let them each introduce themselves to you all. Um, when you guys introduce yourselves, if you want to tell us which school you went to, I know for most of you that's one of the Duke schools. If you can also tell us what you're currently doing, and then if you can tell the competitors that are going to be up here in a few minutes pitching to you all, if there's one thing that you're going to be looking for tonight in their pitches. So we can start over here and work our way back. Uh, so uh, Derek Holt, uh, Fuqua, uh, class of 2009. I'm currently the president of a startup here in, uh, actually in Raleigh, so not here in Durham, but uh, close enough, uh, that focuses on bringing Internet of Things technology uh, into the senior living and those living with disabilities uh, space. And uh, uh, I previously was at Startup America uh, up in DC, so just came back to the area more recently. So I'm Reed Lewis, Trinity, 1984, computer science uh, and math. Uh, I started a software company right after Duke, which we happily sold, took too long. Um, but along the way, I realized that Duke alumni didn't have the networks that Stanford, Harvard, and MIT had, so I co-founded Duke Gen with Howie, who is awesome. Uh, <laughs> and having sold GroupLogic, now I've started another company, also curiously with some IoT technologies. Ah, and when I talk, when I hear from the startups tonight, what I'm interested in is how you're going to take our $50,000 and, and make a memorable impact. So next year, we want you on those slides. That's great. Uh, my name is Idan Karen. Uh, I was Duke 09 undergrad. Um, currently, I'm one of the co-founders of Wetpix. Um, we're one of the companies, the, the companies that have raised uh, quite a bit of money um, in Raleigh. Um, I also started a company right off out of Duke uh, and moved to San Francisco, uh, and I and I sold that one um, without raising any capital. So I do have some experience about that with that as well. Um, today, um, just adding on to what he said, um, I I do want to see that there is uh, like you know being a startup, you do want to grow very fast. So I do want to see that ability to scale very fast, and as well make sure that fifty thousand dollars goes to a good something that's gonna help you do that. Hi, I'm Jake Stauk. Uh, I was at Trinity, uh, class of 2013. I'm the founder of NeuroPlus. We make brain-controlled video games that help kids with ADHD improve their attention. It's really cool. Um, as far as what I'm looking for tonight, um, you know, I really wanna see you guys around in three to five years. I think that's a big metric for me, is, is convince me that three to five years they're gonna be talking about you on the stage and you're still gonna be in existence doing what you're pitching to us tonight. Hey everyone, I'm Brooks with Brooks Bell. So I started Brooks Bell um, right after I graduated at, from Duke in No. 2 and we help large companies scale their A-B testing platforms. I also co-founded HQ Raleigh, which is a co-working space in Raleigh, and also co-founded Think House, which is a co-living space for recent graduates of the area universities and are focusing on scaling their startup. So I hope all the startups here tonight have considered applying to be part of the Think House. So, and so what I'm looking for tonight are companies who have really established a track record with their startup and are showing a real commitment with sticking with it and scaling it, preferably locally in the area. Uh, I think the Triangle is really an incredible place to start a startup and huge competitive advantage. And I think uh, I'd love to see the company continue to grow in this area. So I'm Josh Felser. Um, I'm always happy to see Reed on a, on a panel because he's actually older than I am. Um, so thanks, Reed. Um, <laughs> so Duke 86, Fuqua 90. Uh, 
And also, I'm here with my, my son, like full circle. He's on his first college trip. He's right back there, Benjamin. Wait. Um, I started a, the first internet music service called Freestyle back in 96, and, um, and an internet video company called Crackle in, in uh, 2006. And I kind of switched sides from entrepreneur to investor, founded Freestyle four years ago. And I think we've actually met with two of the, these two guys and their companies um, back in the day. Oh. Well, I'm looking for, uh, I want to hear about uh, massive ownable markets. Massive ownable markets tonight. Hi, I'm Melissa Bernstein, third oldest maybe in the group. <laughs> um, graduated uh, from Duke in 1986, had a brief stint and a uh, very painful stint as an investment banker and then left to start a toy company with my then boyfriend, Doug. Um, and 27 years later, we still have our toy company and um, have uh, really had a great time designing sort of simple toys to inspire free play in children. Uh, one of the things I enjoy most now is my husband and I um, sponsor a program at Duke called Melissa and Doug Entrepreneurs, where we try to inspire young entrepreneurs to not make the same mistakes we did and help mentor them through the difficult road to uh, starting a viable company. And what I look for, I'm a very simple person, is a problem that has a really amazing idea um, and way, I'm sorry, an idea and problem that you've figured out a great way to solve. <laughs> My name is Stephen Young, and um, I graduated from Fuqua in 2013, so I'm definitely in the runnings for the youngest up here as well. Um, I, uh, I helped found Lowe's Ventures from Lowe's Companies, the home improvement store down in Charlotte. Uh, we're about a year old and um, looking to do early stage investments in Series C and Series A companies that help people love where they live. Um, and tonight I'm looking to see how the founders carry themselves. We've seen like a, a quick paragraph about their company, but I really want to see them and, and how they um, feel and how, how much passion they have about, about their vision. And it's something you can't get any other way than just seeing them interact. Well, you guys already know who I am, and you already know what I'm looking for because I put it up. The only thing I can say is I have a huge competitive advantage. Because I didn't go to Duke, my year and age, thus age, <laughs> is not exposed. So no one will know, but I, I might be the eldest. Thanks, <laughs> actually, for questions. So now we're going to get started with our first company, Anderson. <laughs> So these two men are dumping 50 gallons of untreated fecal waste into the community's river. This is what waste treatment looks like for the majority of the world. Untreated waste spread, spreads diarrheal disease, especially among children. Diarrheal diseases kill more children than HIV, AIDS, malaria, and measles combined. In 2013, that number was 500,000 childhood deaths. That means over the span of this pitch, there will be four child deaths because of untreated waste. Untreated waste not only spreads disease, it causes serious environmental damage and financial loss. Indonesia alone loses $2.9 billion a year because of untreated waste. Our mission at Anderson is to provide a solution to, to treatment in developing countries. This solution was developed from a technology at Duke University through the Pratt School of Engineering. This is a self-sustaining treatment system that takes waste, creates energy, and uses that energy to treat it. Fecal waste comes into the digester. Through a process called anaerobic digestion, this is turned into energy. Part of that energy then is used to disinfect the waste through heat treatment. What comes out of our system is a sterile liquid. This liquid is full of nutrients, which are now valuable as fertilizer. In addition, we create more energy from the waste than we actually use. That extra energy can go back to the customer and power other needs that they have or be used by them as a product. So we offer, offer multiple bottom lines, disease reduction, environmental protection, and value generation. Our goal is to work with sanitation entrepreneurs and NGOs that are already providing sanitation across the world. We provide our customers a low maintenance solution that fits on a low footprint and has modular design so we can fit in almost any context. Most importantly, we provide reliable, effective treatment. This goes, this goes to the customer at an affordable price of $50,000. However, 
our customers can regain those costs within two years based on the value of the outputs from our system. After that time, the revenue created by our system goes to the customer and enables their growth. With this model, our company can remain profitable while we enable our customers to expand. So together, we can spread the coverage of sanitation to the billions in need. This, this system has been developed and implemented in Kenya, the Philippines, and India. We have five operational units in three countries and already serving 135 people. Through an on-site workshop in Indonesia involving key stakeholders, an initial customer was established. Our customer would like us to implement our first commercial unit in Indonesia in 2016, one unit serving 750 people on a small island that has no waste treatment. They would like to continue the following year with five units serving 5,000 people. This is full coverage for the island. The need is big in Indonesia. There are 15,000 similar islands that have no waste treatment. Our customer wants to reach these, and Anderson wants to help. We also plan to expand our efforts by working with the international collaborators that we've already formed through our experience, as well as adding new collaborators so that we can maximize our impact. So we have a product, and we have a customer, and with your support, we can make a difference. $50,000 fully covers our initial rollout and provides waste treatment to 750 people that have none. With your support in this key step, you can help, help us launch our company to truly make a global impact and to help stop the spread of diarrheal disease. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. We're now going to let the judges decide on one question to ask you. Um, so you guys can choose amongst yourselves. So our question is, how can you protect the intellectual property of your digester so that someone can't just copy it? So I'm in conversations with Duke offices of licensing and venture. Um, however, I think the IP may not necessarily be the strength of our product. It's mainly the expert know-how that we have, as well as the connections and the strategic timing that we have. Um, so we are looking into that and working on it. Uh, but I know in these markets, it's a difficult challenge, and is especially where we're trying to go. Thank you. So let's give Anderson a round of applause. All right. So our next competitor is a little bit of a last-minute addition. He was in China without internet access, but give a round of applause for Actilivy. Thank you. Hello, so my name is James Sue, and uh, I'm the representative from ActiLeavy. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about our new mobile application. It's going to be called Vites. And so the point of ActiLeavy, we started this company because we believe that technology should be used to bring people together. And we've noticed that current social media platforms, since it's all based on a business model that revolves around the web, computers, and it's not motivating people to go outside and do things and connect with their local surroundings and connect with the people they care about, uh, make their interactions with it, uh, people they care about. And so for Vites, uh, what we're trying to do right now is currently we're working on a way to efficiently schedule things with people. Uh, for our team, we, we were lucky here to get here today. We were very fortunate. We had a lot of mentorship, uh, mentors that helped us a lot of team members that uh, came and contributed in some way or the other, but uh, our two main team members are Ping Wen On. He's the first one on top. He's our techno co-founder. I found him at a convention in Star uh, California, and he's our primary iOS engineer. Now he works at Apple. And the, on the bottom, that's me. Uh, so, so I'm a computer science and EC double major. Uh, I'm class of 2016, so I'll be graduating this year. Well, this is supposed to be a short video. I'm not sure if I can play this or not, but it's supposed to help highlight the difficulties we face, uh, tremendous efficiency, actually, we face in scheduling things with people. Normally, it involves a lot of unnecessary texting, emailing, a lot of conversations going back and forth to try to find a set time to do something. That's supposed to be very easy. It's supposed to be a one-step process. 
And for application advice, this is our preliminary uh, uh, prototype that we're currently working on right now is it shows you your entire calendar. It's very easy to see. You create an event, and you see your calendar. You pick certain times you want to use. Uh, it's as simple as tap and go. And then you can send out these invites. Uh, as for the invitees, the people who receive the invites, they see it on their calendar as a very easy to see kind of you know uh, position. And then they can see. So for example, right here, uh, I see that there was an invite for maybe from five to seven for a dinner. And I see, it, see that it doesn't have any con scheduling conflicts with my calendar. And so I can swipe up, and then I can vote yes. Uh, maybe for another kind of uh, invite that my friend sent out, I can see that this one I would not be able to make to because I have something I need to go to at that time. And I'll be able to just easily swipe down, keep going, and vote no. So right now, uh, we're also working on a web-based API that would make everything a lot easier for people. It would just be a simple text. Uh, you wouldn't have to actually download the application itself. You can use the services very easily. It's all online. And you know, it's as simple as tapping on a link, verifying what you want. It's basically Doodle for mobile. And we hope to provide a useful tool in helping people manage their daily interactions and grow like a social platform virally. So what does the app actually do? Uh, eventually, we'll want to connect the events, the people, the venue and location, the businesses, the groups in your local surrounding, all their events, and push it directly to your calendar. It would be managed easily in one place, which is our application itself. And you can easily explore what is going on around you at specific times, locations. And you'll be able to send it directly to your calendar and save it. And it'll be easy just as you know, a tap of a button. Uh, in terms of monetization, we've been thinking about working on, you know, uh, integrating it. Yeah. We're, sorry, we're at four minutes. Oh, and okay. If you want to wrap up quickly. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so this is basically our, our, our idea, and that, that's about it. Thank yeah, you. thank you. <laughs> All right, <laughs> sorry. We've got a tight schedule, so we'll go to the judges for a question now. So we, per, uh, we want to provide a free user experience. So users won't have to pay anything. It's completely free for them. Also, we want to integrate it with a lot of useful kind of uh, ways to interact with your local surroundings, like making reservations through OpenTable. It, once you schedule things with your friends, it's all, uh, the reservation is made, everything is done, it's dealt for, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. And so I, uh, we feel like this integrated approach you know, with events and, and everything in general would help um, make this kind of origin originally tedious step very simple. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause for Act Thank you. Oh, you can just stand back to me. All right. So our next competitor is going to try and Skype in. So bear with us for just one second. Um, well, thank you all for having me today. I'm Skyping in from San Francisco. My name is Sachi Takahashi Ryle, and I graduated from the Stanford School of Public Policy in 2015. All right, so today I want to talk to you about Dropbuy. And um, Dropbuy is a collaborative calendar for real estate agents. We're helping them schedule their showings. Next slide. All right, there are a ton of stakeholders in the real estate showing process. There's buyers, sellers, as well as their agents. Scheduling is painful currently, not only for buyers who experience delays in scheduling due to tons of back and forth phone calls with their agents, but also for sellers who are really giving up control over their home. They don't know who's coming and going, they don't know when. And it's really worst of all for agents. They're wasting a ton of time on scheduling through phone calls that they could be spending um, closing deals. And for everyone, there's a lack of viewership data. So what that means is that 
um, for all of these parties. They don't know how many folks are coming, when they're coming to see the house, how hot this property is. And that information is really valuable in the negotiation process, making a fair deal. Um, so right now, like I said, there's a ton of back and forth. There's so many stakeholders. There are a bunch of steps, contacting agents, contacting sellers. What Drop By does is take that into one click. And what does that look like? Next. So a buyer looks for a property online. This is what already happens. They're going to Zillow, they're going to Trulia, and they'll see a drop by button that says see it now. Once they click that slide, they'll be taken to a collaborative calendar that populates their agent's availability as well as the home's availability. So with one click, they can schedule that showing. Next. So we already have a few users. Asa was one of our very first real estate agents that signed on. He's in the Raleigh area. And Asa uses Dropby to differentiate himself from his competitors, which is always huge, especially for real estate agents when they're trying to market themselves to potential sellers. Asa uses Dropby to save time and manage his schedule. Next. And Asa's not the only one that can benefit from Dropby. There are one million agents in the US and they schedule 110 million property showings annually. So just having a tiny piece of this market is huge. And the typical agent spends over $500 on technology per year. So we see that agents are willing to spend money on this type of time-saving tool. Okay. There are a couple folks that are in this market already. Um, most of them are over 20 years old, and the way that they interact with customers is similarly antiquated. What we're going for is drop by producing a better quality of product and quantity of services, as you can see here, from the technology that we're going to leverage. Okay. That being said, we have we have a great team, not only with development talent, um, Brian and Bill, but also with real estate experience, myself, George, and Joe. Okay. We've made a ton of progress in the last year, not only from building our business plan, developing an alpha, getting it out to folks. This summer, we really focused on making sure that those people that were using our alpha, that their experience was improving week by week. Um, we've been iterating, and uh, our next step would be to launch the beta and we to take it out of the friends and family realm to an even greater market. So what that looks like, is um, yeah, Sachi. Sorry, that's time. All right, all right. All right but so let's go for a question. Yeah. Sorry. So, what is the the business proposition here? Like, how do you make your your profits? Did you hear that question? Yeah, definitely. So, I. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. I stopped. Uh -oh. <laughs> currently by um, their scheduling tools, or it could be more of a premium model where we're giving the tool for free, but then charging for this viewership data that's so, that's so valuable. All right, thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So our next team is EduLife. Guys, are you having a good time? <laughs> well, uh, I'm here to tell you the story of Sam. Sam is a 14-year-old bright kid. His parents are illiterate and has an annual income of $1,200. So Sam attends a local school with the poor infrastructure and the ill-equipped teachers. Still, he dreams to become a doctor. But to get admission into a medical school, he has to pass an entrance exam because the number of seats are very limited. Here comes the problem. This, these entrance exams are not coach proof, and there are coaching institutes that provide specific training to crack these entrance exams. Let's fast forward a year. Sam did what, what most of the Indian students do. He studied under a poor education system, and he took the, this entrance exam, but he didn't make it. And ultimately, he landed into unemployment and the poor menial labor jobs. Sam's story is one of the 95 million stories in India who are competing in different competition exams to become doctor, engineer, lawyer, or any other higher education degree. What if there was a solution, or what if there was a course that was designed for the students like Sam? 
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to EduLife. My name is Aditya Sharma, and this is my team of 24 highly dedicated professionals. I founded EduLife in 2013 with the vision to create equal opportunity education by providing high quality digital education resources in form of video lectures, online practice tests, and the modules. EduLife does this in two ways. First, using our website and our mobile app, we help 31 million students in India who have access to computer and internet. To help the remaining students who do not have access to internet or computer, EduLife has an offline model. This way, uh, in the offline model, we improve the standard of education in schools. And this way, we help not only Sam, but hundreds of his friends or, and his classmates. EduLife run 90 minutes of classes in school every day throughout the year to help students prepare for the competition exams. EduLife is not only about providing high quality education, but we are bringing the digital learning revolution in India. And this aligns with the Digital India campaign of our Honorable Prime Minister. Let's have a look at EduLife's achievements so far. We had 1.3 million visitors in 2014 on our education and career counseling portal. Our uh, EduLife database has more than 7,000 video lectures. EduLife is present in more than 17 schools in the state of Rajasthan, and now we are expanding to three more states. We have recently collaborated with 943 schools in India, and this is not it. World's largest NGO, RSS, is one of our prime supporters. As far as the financials are concerned, EduLife like despite providing, uh, despite providing high quality material at such in low prices, our revenue generation model is very strong. From the investor's point of view, it's a highly profitable business because profit margin will keep on rising in three years. You might think how we differ from our competitors. Well, Edulife service is 99.2% time cheaper than the, pro than the current services available in the market. Edulife, uh, we have invested $40,000 as a personal fund, and we are in the requirement of $87,000 more to achieve our target of uh, 2016. Duke Startup Challenge $50,000 will help us fill this gap and cover most of our major expenses. I received a happy reminder last week when my mom called me and she told me that Sam came to our home with his younger brother, and he requested to implement EduLife system in his brother's school. We might be too late to help Sam, but we are in time to, help, to transform the life of his brother and the whole generation of future students. And that makes every effort worth it. Thank you for your time. All right. Okay. Well, take this mic and hand it to you guys. Thank you guys. So I know how much I'm spending on test prep for my kids, and it's, <laughs> I might want to use it. No, it's an unfair advantage, so you're democratizing the whole testing process. It's pretty amazing. My question is, is given how few people have digital access, how do you really scale the offline model? Okay. Okay, so our offline model is for, the, for those students who don't have access to internet and the computer because internet is penetrating in, the, in, in India in recent days, and the government is taking initiative to improve it. So we are improving the standard of education in schools. We are approaching the schools, and we are selling them our product, our whole high-quality education resources at $75 per annum. And the school administration is paying for it, not the students. School administration is paying because they are getting a high-quality education from the faculty members who charge around $100,000 uh, $100, in uh, per year, which they can't afford. So they are getting that, uh, that quality resources, and hence the result of their school is improving. Students are getting benefited. They are getting more and more admissions. We started with one school in May 2015, and right now we are present in 17 schools. This is all because of our good work and the feedback that we have received from students, from the school administration, and the other NGOs that are, that are associated with it. And recently, we have collaborated with a network of 943 schools in India. And like they're ready to start it. Right, great. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. All right. Our next team is Ello Raw. Hi. My name's Becky. Um, I'm a recent grad of Duke University, and I founded Ello Raw. So we all have a time in our life where everything stood still. 
where we stopped and in that moment we realized that this was a time we would never forget for the rest of our lives. For me, one of those times was spending morning standing in line at a homeless shelter so that I could get a bag of groceries so my family would have enough to eat. So for many Americans, when they bring home a bag of groceries, what's inside of it is processed junk, it's filled with chemicals and fillers. And after seeing my family struggle and struggle and struggle with health issues, physical health issues, obesity and mental illness, I realized that food matters. That what we put in our bodies truly affects how we live our lives. And so I set off to create a food product that put people's health first and that gave back to fight food insecurity. Welcome, Ella Raw. So Ella Raw, we make raw dessert bites. So they're filled with whole ingredients, healthy, they're gluten-free, soy-free, egg-free, dairy-free, made with organic ingredients and non-GMO. They truly work for your body and not against it. So judges, you each have a bag under your chair. You can go ahead and enjoy some samples. Sorry, audience, I'm sorry. Don't be too jealous. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the three flavors. We have coconut chocolate chip cookie dough, which as you can see, six simple ingredients. Cashews, which is a great source of natural protein. Coconut oil, which is great for your digestion, also great for your skin, hair, nails, good stuff. All right, the second one is goji cacao brownie. It's also filled with nuts, dates, which are high in fiber, and cacao powder, which is the raw form of cocoa. Cacao powder has more antioxidants than blueberries, and it's a natural antidepressant, a mood booster, and has more calcium than cow's milk. Last but not least, we have cinnamon sugar donut, which is our sweetest variety. Again, filled with dates, are high in fiber, also cinnamon, which is great for our metabolism. So, the health food market is booming, it's growing, and I think everyone in this room probably realizes that. So 100 million people are choosing more plant-based foods every day. The, the natural food industry is on the rise. By 2017, it's supposed to hit globally $1 trillion. That's crazy, and Ellerol is on that wave. So we're currently selling online, and we've been doing that for the, for the past 10 months, um, but our big focus right now is retails. That's where we really want to scale. So we're focusing on grocery stores, cafes, health stores, and kind of playing around with some creative different avenues like a raw subscription box and sending out things with that as well as corporate gifts. So competition. Um, all of our competition, or one thing that makes us, differentiates us, is that we're actually a raw product. So all of our competition claims to be raw, um, but one thing that's very true is that raw is not a regulated word, so people slap that on any product um, without actually looking at the ingredients. So raw, raw food is anything that's not heat processed. So heat processing removes all the natural enzymes and nutrients that our bodies need. What we don't realize is that most food we eat is void of all of that because it's been heat processed and all of those natural great nutrients have been taken out. So our top competitors um, both use a sweetener as one of their first ingredients, agave nectar or maple syrup, none of which are actually raw. They're both heat processed and agave is big in raw foods, but actually spikes your blood, your blood sugar just like high fructose corn syrup. Another thing they have is vanilla extract, which is also not raw. So now I want to introduce you to our awesome team, which is another differentiator. That's me. Hi, Becky. Um, so I could tell you about my entrepreneurship experience, but what I really want to focus on is why I'm going to be the one to lead this company forward. And that's because I'm passionate. This is where my heart is. Um, I'm a hard worker. I'm a hustler. I will work harder than anyone. Um, Overcoming obstacles is, is in my blood. I do it every day and it, nothing's gonna stop me. I'm working full time in this venture and I'm committed to seeing it successful. So I also have some incredible advisors um, who are providing amazing support, who are entrepreneurs in their own right in the food and beverage industry, also consulting experience, strategy experience, and investing experience. So where we're going, the most excited part. Um, we're in three retail retailers currently. We're in Joe Van Gogh Cafe, they're opening up they're opening up an additional store, so they have three right now we're in, so go buy us on campus. Um, we're also in, uh, sorry, NoFo Market in Raleigh. We're in Even Hotels, which is a wellness hotel chain that's opening up three um, hotels in New York, and they already have two right now, which we're in. We're also closing deals with Relay Foods and Thrive Market, a national um, brand this week, really excited about, and, and we're in the initial um, phases with some local Whole Foods, Lomo Market. We're really excited um, for where we're going, and we're gonna get there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah. Turn it over to the judges for a question. Oh, thank you. 
Congratulations, I love that uh, traction, love to see it. So explain to me, because uh, having experience with uh, Mati, um, I know the Whole Foods process is long. Talk to me where you're at in the Whole Foods process and uh, what you think the revenue is going to be like once you get there. Yeah, so we've just started um, initially talking them. So a few months ago we were talking to the one in Durham, um, kind of went through some hurdles, and so we decided to focus more on that local, smaller production so that we could fund it. Everything's bootstrapped right now. We want to be lean. Um, so we just started talking, got some interest and some, um, some interest in the product at Whole Foods in Raleigh. And so um, we're looking at numbers, we're looking at starting that process. And so like we said, we hope to, we'll be doing 7,000 um, in revenue by the end of February with Whole Foods. Um, our capacity right now, we are going to get about $20,000 um, in revenue. So really excited about where that's gonna go. Congratulations. Thank you so all much. Right. Thank you, let's give them a round of applause. And our next team is Cannabis. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Devika. Our business idea is simple, stylish, and right here in front of you. I'm wearing it. Uh, it's a footwear company called Cannabis. We're, we are based out of New Delhi, India. All our shoes are exclusively de designed, very high in quality, and cruelty-free. We don't use any leather in any of our shoes. So as you all know, India is one of the fastest growing economy, and so is the Indian footwear industry. Currently, the size is about $4 billion, growing aggressively at 25% year on year. Sorry. So our, today, our focus is on women aged 15 to 35, only in tier one and tier two cities in India, which gives us a total addressable market of over $1.6 billion. So what does our product look like? It is super stylish super comfortable. It's got an insole cushion, a very durable outsole, open to a feature for the hot Indian climate, and painless heels. Ladies, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> We're competitively priced at average of $40, and we use very high quality canvas, jute, fabric, everything but leather. So we've already taken our first steps. We have 42 SKUs in six sizes, revenues of $40,000 in five months. We have sold over 1,000 pairs since launch. We are now at four stores in three major cities in India. We sell online on our website and two other fashion portals. And we have showcased at 18 trunk shows in eight cities across the country. And customers are loving our products. We received extremely positive feedback from customers who bought it online, who bought it from other cities, and customers from Duke as well. We have a very unique positioning. So Indian retail is 70% unbranded. So we are a brand that offers affordable, affordable product at a very high quality, which is super fashionable, and we're only animal friendly. We're the only animal friendly brand. So our strategy, what it looks like, there are five vectors of growth we've identified. Product, target customer, geography, channel, and price point segmentation. Today, our focus is only on shoes, for women in tier one, tier two cities in India. But as we grow, we plan to expand our product offering across, across customer channels, across price point segmentations and geographies. So by 2025, this is the vision. We want to be one of, the, one of the largest apparel brand. So how we do it? We design all our products in-house. We handpick all our fabric. I've outsourced the manufacturing to India and China and we manage all the distribution in-house at a warehouse in New Delhi. The branding has been taken care of, it's trademarked in India, and the pricing is also handled by us. We sell online and offline. So what we really need today is the 50,000. It could really help us grow and achieve the scale we, need, we, we envision. What we really need is, is towards inventory. We plan to invest 30,000 towards our inventory and then invest the rest in digital marketing, offline marketing, and travel and other business expenses. Today, our team is small but adequate, so I work closely with my creative head, and we have a business advisor who's based out of Boston, and we also have two interns who help us. With that, I leave the floor open to questions, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So we'll go to our judges for a question. Oh, the mic's right. Oh, no, you're good. It's right down here. Yeah, just go, yeah. Um, what, 
what is it about the Indian market that's special, and why, why are you targeting that um, when, when there are some things that look similar in the States and other places like Tom's? What, what is it that sets you apart, and why, why India? Right. Well, a couple of reasons. A, I'm Indian, and I'm based out of Delhi. So that's a natural place to start. But also, India is actually one of the fastest growing right now. In fashion as well, if you look at the market, uh, the growth rate is, is, is off the charts. And I, because I'm selling online, the e-commerce today is just 20 billion. Of that, 30% is just fashion and footwear. But 2020 is going to be $32 billion. So I think that's the fastest growth, like that's a growth market. But we do plan to expand ex internationally. And as for Tom's, they, they do leather. It's not non-leather. So ours is an only animal-friendly brand. That's a differentiator as well. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> All right. So our next company is Kedge Conservation. So we are Kedge Conservation. And we are here because you have a problem. And that problem is that there are two and a half billion people around the world who are unbanked. That means they have no access to banks. That's 600 million people in Africa, south of the Sahara alone. And these people are living in a form of poverty that is essentially preventable because of this lack of access. See, the thing about being unbanked is that people without access to banks are constantly at risk. Their household savings are constantly at risk. Risk of robbery risk of fire, risk of flood. And more than just being unbanked, often these people are unbankable. Uh, that means that people don't understand how money works, what it is, how to use it, how to save it, how to manage it. And so they can't benefit from even existing financial tools. So what's the solution here? Is the answer to kind of just throw money at this problem, give these people more money? No, not alone, not necessarily. The answer is providing people with access and education. So that's what we try to do. We make people bankable. We make the unbankable bankable. So we take someone like David here in Kenya, and we give David a financial education. That financial education lets David lift his income 10 to 20%. We're averaging around 10.22%. And increase his financial transaction usage. We work with mobile money corporations. Uh, to provide access for rural people by using mobile money, which makes up about 16% of the transactions that happen in Kenya now. So once David has more access, more income, David can now link this mobile money account to a bank account. So we also work with banks as partners. And so now David has the benefit of being banked, of having access to financial services. And the best part about it is that we get repaid uh, in full. So we take a commission from the mobile money company and also from the bank as a market expansion fee, right? Because we're able to reach people that they can't reach, and we're able to make them bankable in a way that they don't have the resources to. And that's in part because we work really lean. Uh, so we founded last year in February 2014. Since then, we've raised a little under 22,000, and we've worked in two countries, helped launch three community ventures, and made bankable 40 new adults. And we're poised to do even more. We've actually secured a partnership to work with Smart Money Project in Uganda. And if we were to get the $50,000 tonight, that would help us kick up our partnership so that we could actually create 2,000 more bankable people in rural communities in the Kasese district just in next summer alone. And what does that even look like? What's our actual impact? All of our Kedge learners live below the poverty line. On average, they're about 25 years old, and they live on less than a dollar a day. 79% of learners live with their families in insecure homes. That means their houses could be taken away at any moment. And one in five, a little more than that, actually, don't even eat every day. So what do you teach to communities like this? How do you try to make a social impact? We teach three key things that we think are really important for transforming rural lives. And that's micro-business entrepreneurship, how to start and sustain small, stable businesses, environment and agriculture, how to feed you and your family sustainably, and household health and hygiene, how to keep from getting sick. And we teach it in this particular way that's very helpful for rural learners. We're talking about people who haven't had formal education or haven't been in formal schooling since they were four or five years old. So because of that, 
we get about an 85.5% average knowledge retention, and our students love us. 60% of them are saying the best thing they learn from us is how to handle money. Another 30% are saying it's communication and respect, and 10% are saying it's cooperation and teamwork, just how to work with people, how to do new things. These are lifelong skills. These are transformative skills. In 2014, we were able to do three new entrepreneurs, and in 2015, three whole new community ventures. In 2016, if we win this, we could do a lot more. So we make unbankable people bankable and banked and help people lead happier, healthier, wealthier lives. Right. That's Kedja's solution. Thank you. Questions? Uh, so congratulations on the progress. Um, so I, I've uh, worked with a variety of organizations uh, that are doing work in Africa, and one of the big challenges always is communication and marketing. So talk a little bit about how you're going to spread the word about the program and get it to the to the places that need it the most. Yeah, absolutely. So there's two things that we do that help us spread our word. So the first is we work very closely with partners. That's one of the things that also helps us stay lean. We don't build new infrastructure. So we, in some cases, particularly in very rural areas, rely on local partners to help spread the word, to help recruit students. But we also use radio. And so that's, some, that's part of our Uganda model, is using radio ads, which actually have much wider distribution than television or other print ads uh, to reach potential. That's great. that's great. Thanks. All right. Great. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Presenter. Our next presenter is Sangha. Good evening. I want to tell you guys about Sangha, a company whose mission is everyday wellness. Now, we've all experienced this. Go into any typical cafe in the country and you'll see this. People hunched over their computers, typing away, trying to be productive. What we're learning now as a society is that we shouldn't, and in fact, that we can't be productive 24 hours a day. That, in fact, we're learning how important it is for our health to make time for slowing down and stepping away from our screens. So I thought, what if there was a space that was dedicated to wellness, to slowing down? This is what Sangha offers. It's a new kind of space. Instead of walking into a noisy cafe with laptop screens everywhere, when you walk into Sangha, you instantly feel this environment of calm and community. Instead of ordering a, a jacked up coffee that's you know, full of sugar, what you can get is a calming and refreshing tea. Now, this was my vision, and it's why I started Sangha. So I wanted to test the concept. Last year, I was entering my fourth year in the PhD program in genetics and genomics here at Duke. And I started selling teas and herbal infusions at the Durham Farmers Market. We're now bringing in $6,000 a month, primarily from this once a week market. That's four hours a week that we're open for business. And the quality of our teas has allowed us to expand rapidly into stores. Two months ago, we were in three locations. Now, we're in nine. We're working now with Southern Season and Whole Foods. We expect to be on Whole Foods shelves by the end of the year. We've been able to accomplish all of this because we're selling a product that people really love. And our numbers show this. This is our actual revenue each quarter since we launched. What you can see is that we've grown consistently each quarter. Over the last quarter alone, we saw 66% growth in our sales. Now, this whole farmer's market operation was really just a test. We wanted to see if people were interested in buying high-quality teas and herbal infusions. And overwhelmingly, they were. But what we found is it was more than just the tea that our customers were asking for. Every single week at the market, our customers ask us when we're going to open up. And what we realized is that our biggest opportunity in the market was not the tea itself, but in the tea house experience. So what's our competition? Starbucks is a $10 billion a year company. What they provide is a space to get caffeinated and get plugged in. What we're providing is something completely different. From the teas that we serve, to the spaces that we provide, to our dedicated spaces for yoga and meditation, everything is geared towards creating this wellness experience. What we're providing is a space to recharge your batteries, so you can go back into your life with more energy and more productivity. Now, tea is a crucial part of this. Tea is the most popular beverage in the world. In the US alone, it's a $10 billion industry. And industry experts are predicting it's going to overtake coffee by 2017. It has a higher profit margin and a longer shelf life than coffee. And it tastes fantastic, and it's good for you, too. It's going to cost us $150,000 to open up our first Sangha. Our average monthly operating expenses are just $10,000. 
meaning we break even if we sell just 78 cups of tea per day. For perspective, we sell twice that in just four hours at the farmer's market. And that's if we were only selling cups of tea. The truth is that we have multiple streams of revenue coming in on top of that. So we have our in-house food and beverage, our wholesale accounts, retail, and our wellness workshops. Now we just need the 150000 to get started. My partners and I have already committed $100,000 of our personal funds because we believe in this. We're willing to bet, to bet our futures on this. So what's our trajectory if we win here tonight? We're going to be opening our flagship location here in Durham in 2016. By 2020, we'll have 10 locations across the East Coast. And by 2025, we'll have a location in every major city in the country. Now, tea is fundamentally about slowing down and making time for connecting with yourself and with your community. More and more people are searching for these connections, and Sangha is leading the way. If we win here tonight, we can start this revolution right here, right now. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. How are you making the tea now, and how can you scale to um, reach higher volume? How are we making the tea? Your, what is your production? How do we produce it? Oh, so we source our teas from around the world. So tea is a lot like wine, where the best teas come from you know, Japan and China and Taiwan. And so we source the best teas, the freshest teas from around the world. Currently, only 10% of all the tea production in the world comes to the US. So it's very easy for us to scale and get a lot more tea. Yeah. No, though we will be working with local farmers in every city that we go to. I mean, there are a lot of herbs. A lot of things come from the US, um, but we source from far and wide and find the best stuff. And that's why people love what we do so much is because we're, we're taking this culture that's, you know, it's 5,000 years old, but we're bringing it and making it really accessible. So right. thank you again. Great. Thank Let's you, give them a round of applause. Thank you. All right. Our next competitor is Sinon. <laughs> Neurological diseases are a growing problem across the globe. For instance, every 67 seconds, someone develops Alzheimer's. The challenge we face today is that only 2% of all drugs and nanoparticles combined can cross the blood-brain barrier. This is our body's natural defense mechanism, which prevents any chemicals, or in this case, drugs from passing through. This makes it extremely difficult to treat neurological diseases. The current technology, think chemo, is very nonspecific and non-targeted. What happens with this is a patient is given a very high dose, and what it yields is a very low therapeutic index and very high toxicity. With our technology, we can use localized therapy where we can significantly reduce the dosage and help reduce the side effects, yet help increase the efficacy of the drug itself. Our solution is a patented nanoparticle, which is the carbon dot. You can encapsulate virtually any drug or gene inside, and it works like a Trojan horse mechanism where once a compound is encapsulated, you can deliver directly into the brain. We've done initial animal studies. This particular slide shows a glioblastoma, which is a, a most aggressive form of brain tumor in a mouse. And the white line you see going down the center is actually the blood vessel, which is the blood-brain barrier, and all the red particles you see are the carbon dots. So it clearly shows that we've been able to penetrate through the membrane, and we've got a good uniform distribution, which is what we were hoping to see. There are current competitors available in the market today. However, they do come with severe side effects. Some of them are too toxic, while others are ineffective. Our closest competitors would be the proteins, However, with the proteins, for every new drug or every new gene you use, you have to modify it. In our case, the carbon dot is a universal platform technology that can be used for any neurological treatment. Currently, the team on the left side is the scientific team, starting with myself, the founder and CEO. I am also the co-inventor on the patent with Dr. Sarkar. Dr. Sarkar and Polanath head our Indian operations for R&D, and Samir is our medical liaison for our collaborations in, in the US. 
On the right, we have a great team of pharmacology and business mentors. As I mentioned, we've already done our preliminary animal studies. The 50,000 will go directly towards feasibility studies. So that includes biodistribution and quantification studies. This is our key missing link between us being able to begin negotiations with biotech and pharma companies. We've already made arrangements with GLP certified labs in India to begin animal testing. Based on the results we get with the feasibility studies, we will be applying for government funding as well as approaching biotech and pharmas. We plan on having five concurrent deals running. We already have interest from three biotech companies. So if you look at by the end of 2016, we could potentially be have uh, a revenue of half a million in milestone payments. And this will be doubling every two years. In summary, we have developed a universal platform technology that is patented, can cross the blood-brain barrier, and is a much safer alternative for targeted drug and gene delivery. We can license by drug, by field, or by organ, and we plan to have an exit within the next four to six years. Thank you. Um, wow. So, we're all wondering kind of why you wrote exit in the next, in the next four to six years versus like, you're so passionate about this, why wouldn't you just build it into a massively successful public company? So our goal is to go the licensing model. Um, we're definitely too small to take it through clinical trials. The first phase itself is 15 million. So we would be partnering with pharma companies and using um, technology that has been shelved or reach FDA approval and cannot be um, used because of their high toxicity. But you know, with this idea and the success you continue to show, you can raise the capital to, to prove this is something massive. Why, <laughs> okay. why are you selling we're, we're out? We're going to take it all the way. <laughs> <laughs> Don't sell out. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. And last but certainly not least, Biflex. Over 700 million people in developing countries need glasses and can't get them. The reason is, in these countries, glasses are too expensive and there's just a scarcity of optometrists. This isn't just a social issue, it's a massive economic problem that results in over $200 billion in lost global productivity each year. The good news is, if you give someone a pair of glasses, you can change their life. They can see, they can read, you increase their work productivity by 35% and increase their monthly income by 20% ultimately allowing them to bring home much needed money and food for them and their families. This is what Viflex is working to do. We've developed a pair of low cost glasses that can be customized for each individual user without an optometrist. We use pre-manufactured lenses that can correct both near and distance vision problems. Here's how they work. First, a user tests different lenses and picks the ones that work for them. I don't wear glasses, but in 20 years, I'll probably need these. <laughs> the user then inserts the lenses into the frames. Lastly, snaps in the arm pieces, which help secure the lenses in, pay, in place. Sorry, a little nervous. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> All right. And just like that, the glasses are ready for use. Judges, we brought along a few of our 3D printed prototypes for you to take a look at. Keep in mind, these are 3D printed. The surface is a little bit rough. When we get our injected molded frames in October, they'll be completely smooth and polished. Fiflex glasses are designed to value. That means we started with the problem and developed a technology to fix it rather than the other way around. Compared to our competition, we are the only solution that doesn't require optometrists or expensive equipment, is cheap enough to actually distribute, and looks good enough to wear on stage in front of several hundred people. <laughs> our go-to-market strategy is simple. We're going to manufacture all the glasses and then sell them in kits to NGOs all across the world. 
This allows us to take advantage of the NGO's already established distribution pathways and local expertise and provides the N NGOs with a low cost and effective means of improving their community. We have been able to receive a broad level of funding so far. We've been able to raise about $37,000, but we do need an additional $50,000 in order to complete our manufacturing, build up inventory, and scale to reach our full potential. One of the unique aspects of Viflex is that we're completely student-led and student-run. Our team consists of 13 undergraduate engineers and two medical students. Over the past year, we've been able to build on the uh, momentum from several engineering competitions and recognition from Chelsea Clinton from Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, partnering up with NGOs, hospitals, and individual physicians, we field, successfully field tested these in eight different countries across four continents. Uh, the feedback we got was overwhelmingly positive, validating our design for aesthetics, functionality, and value. In October, we'll receive our first injection molded frames, which will be used in November to fill our first large scale orders. In the winter, we'll be traveling to Nepal to, with the focus in the spring to expand our NGO customer base. Viflex is trying to solve an enormous problem that afflicts the world's, one of the world's um, most marginalized people. There's no one simple solution, but we strongly believe that with your support, that we can tremendously impact the lives of those who are trying to face. And thank you, and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions now. Thank you. So this is a wonderful cause. I can certainly see the, the problem that you guys are solving. Is it, is, it a, is it a nonprofit, or is there a revenue model? So we are structured as a for-profit company. We really believe that this will allow us to be most sustainable, um, scale our efforts, and really make the largest impact that we can, because that's really what it's all about, making an impact in all these people's lives. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, and give a round of applause for Viflex and all of our competitors. The judges are now going to be sequestered to pick the winner of the grand prize while you all get started on voting for your favorite pre presentation of the evening. All right, you guys can come with me. On, hello? Okay, so here's what's gonna happen. Uh, lights up, please. So all of you in the audience, you are going to now vote for your favorite team. We're gonna show some codes here and you're gonna send a text message with the code corresponding to the team that you want to win. This vote is only meant for people in the audience here tonight, so do not post it on Twitter, Facebook, send it to your friends via text message. Uh, we will only accept responses of people that are here tonight, and the way we're gonna validate that is we're gonna do a hand count for the winning team, okay? So, and the, the way that this works is that uh, the winner will automatically receive $2,500. In the event of a tie for the judge's vote for the Wicked Family Prize, the audience choice winner is going to be the tiebreaker, okay? So with that, time to vote for your favorite team. You're gonna send a text message. Okay, we are gonna close the polls now. Congratulations to Sangha. All right, Sangha, come on up here with the Blue Devil. And we're gonna take a photo. And after that, the Blue Devil is going to hand out t-shirts here to all the audience members. While you are catching t-shirts, you should all have a raffle ticket in front of your seat. Please look at your raffle ticket now. Blue Devil, please come on down to select the raffle ticket winner. So look at your raffle ticket. Please do not take raffle tickets in seats next to you. That's not cool. You must be present to win. All right, Blue Devil, time to select a winner. Go for it. <laughs> All right, this ticket is red. Do we have 816417? No, we'll need another ticket. Another ticket, please. All right, 816-438, no. Oh yes, wait, wait. say it again, 417? 816-417, all right, congratulations, come on up here. 
Show me your ticket here. <laughs> All right. Yes, we have a winner. Congratulations. Give the Blue Devil a hug. All right. Melissa's got some questions for you that, you, that you'll need to answer, OK? OK. So while we are waiting on the judges, we are going to Blue Devil, thank you so much for your work as always. While we are waiting for the judges, we're going to have a short showcase of some of our undergraduate teams in the Melissa and Doug Entrepreneurs Program. Next up is Casper with Carpe. How's everybody doing tonight? All right, a mediocre response, that's good. Could I have all of you guys do me a big favor, pull out your phones right now and go to carpelotion.com. Just do that real quick. Like, I gave some of you a shirt, you owe me, you owe me a website hit. Carpe Lotion, you can Google it, find the website, carpelotion.com. All right, my investors are gonna love that traffic, thank you. Uh, so I am Casper, I'm a junior at Duke, my co-founder David is a junior at UNC, he's actually a really smart guy, turns out the only thing they're bad at is sports. Um, and we both have a problem, we have really sweaty hands, you know, when we're nervous, when we're playing sports, in all sorts of situations. And uh, we thought this was kind of a unique problem because there's not really anything out there uh, to solve it. You know, we have, under, we have underarm antiperspirants, but we don't have anything for our hands. And you don't catch game-winning passes and seal deals with your underarms. Use your hands, right? It seems like the hands are the more important thing to get rid of the sweat. And it actually turns out that 10 million people in the United States have medically diagnosed over sweatiness. 100 million people think they do sweat too much. So it seems like there's a market there. Uh, a lot of investors, when we started out a year ago, didn't really believe that there's a market there, but we're like, okay, we gotta make this. We need to solve this problem for ourselves. Let's see if it sells. Um, so we spent a year developing the formula, using the most powerful ingredient out there we know as an antiperspirant, uh, and just making it feel good on your hands. And then in the spring, we got 50 grand of investment from Duke uh, alumni, who Howie connected me with, so that's thanks to Duke INE. And we were able to launch. We were able to start selling two months ago, uh, we're on Amazon right now, about 40 reviews, about 4.5 stars. Got two negative reviews the other day, so we're down to 4.2, so that was a pretty, pretty big blow to me. Um, but people love it. People love it in general. Uh, we've got $21,000 in sales in the first two months, and this is just some of what our customers have to say. So if you or anybody you know is sick of your sweaty hands, give Carpe Lotion a try. Thanks for hearing me out, guys. Have an awesome night. Okay, next up is biometrics. How do I use this thing? Right is forward. <laughs> All right, so my name is Ivana Dumanyan. I am a current Duke undergrad, as you know, a former Duke athlete. My partner and I started Biometrics Tech um, because we had problems with injury, prehab, rehab. Any of you who are athletes, runners, know that this is a huge problem. You pretty much can't go through an entire year as a runner, an athlete of any kind, without sustaining some sort of injury. And so our response to this problem was to figure out a new, novel, flexible, thin, easy to wear, wearable sensor device that can be worn directly on your skin, under clothing, while you move, while you sweat, while you work out. It's the smallest and simplest solution available on the market right now. And we're being adopted by some motion capture firms, some, stu some university athletic programs all around the nation, and we're looking to uh, bring our solution to any athlete uh, that suffers from injury. Uh, to give you some context, that's about every athlete, um, 60 days per year on average, and we're bringing that number down um, to 50, 40, 30 if we can. Um, we're currently in the process of building out our development team. Our needs are growing much faster than our team is, so if you have experience as a tech developer, software developer, app developer, go to our website, biometricstech.com, drop us a line uh, in our comments box, or you can email us directly at uh, careers at biometricstech.com. So take down the, the website, and we look forward to hearing from you. And if you're interested in trying, being one of the first pilot um, users of the product, do the same. Leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. Bye. Nice job, Ivana. By the way, Shelly here, Shelly Lee? No, okay. So possibly our last one, we have Alex Elsie. Let me pull up your slides here, my friends. 
So I'm here to talk to you about Fly Lady Premium. And uh, what we do is we guide our customers through decluttering their homes and establishing routines that take the chaos out of running a home and running a family. Uh, or maybe. <laughs> so uh, we partner with the industry leader in home management systems. They have 900,000 subscribers that are trying to figure this out. Uh, we partnered with them because they ran into a problem and we had a solution. Um, that's the last slide. <laughs> there we go. Uh, uh, does this thing work? Should be. Just go ahead and tell me next slide. Perfect. Next slide. <laughs> so they have 900,000 subscribers. Uh, they ran into a problem in that when they hit 900,000, uh, they peaked. After 16 years, they were founded in 99. Uh, they peaked at 900,000. And what they were doing is they, uh, actually what they still do, they guide women through decluttering their homes and lives with an email uh, list, a mass email system. But email's becoming obsolete, and so they run in, ran into that issue, and they needed to get ready for the next generation, the next, they need, needed to adapt. And so, go ahead. Uh, I went to them and I said, I think I can create a solution for you. Uh, and I had some grounds for saying that. I was the first employee slash intern of a uh, sharing economy based startup called Bellhops that recently achieved a 50 million valuation. So I went to them and I was like, let me get try fixing this. Next slide. And so I surveyed their members, uh, sent it to 3,000 of their random members, and learned that 97.49% of their customers weren't reaching their goal after two years. Uh, that's the percent that still had clutter in their home after two years. Learned that 60% of their customers are dealing with depression and isolation, and that's the root cause of the clutter. And so I said to the CEO, how about instead of through emails, we teach the system through humans? Uh, what if we hired your members that have really figured this out, the 2.5%, and paired them up with 15 to 20 of your members each that, uh, that are struggling with this, and we create a premium service for that? And uh, she loved the idea, created a minimum viable site, sent out a video looking for those members that have figured it out. And at the bottom, uh, I put an application link that was on the website. And uh, just so happens I had the website ready for orders. And in 48 hours, we had $20,000 in sales. And uh, I shut everything down, all the marketing, all the sales. And I was like, this 100 customers, let's just perfect the system with it. Go ahead. And uh, so I had 120 customers immediately and no service to give them. Uh, that's a problem. So <laughs> I, we had 208 applications to be a fly lady mentor, as I called it. Uh, we hired 22 of them originally and started training them. They're in five different countries, 17 different states, seven different time zones. And uh, then I said, OK, next thing we need to do, we need to teach this system through an online video course instead of through emails. So I had the fly lady, the one that all of their customers knew and trusted and loved, had her record her system over videos. Uh, next one. And then uh, to deal with the depression and isolation that their customers are facing, we created a community of all of our members. Uh, each mentor and her group gets a private Facebook group, and they get to interact with each other, and they get to motivate and support each other along the way. And when this happened, we saw something really crazy happen. Uh, this is 10 days in to the uh, test whenever I took this screenshot. And what's happening is instead of just the mentors supporting the customers, the com customers are also supporting the customers. Uh, these comments you're seeing at the bottom, these aren't our employees. These are the fellow customers. Uh, they're becoming a family. Each group is. And that's just as good as it gets. We're really excited about that. Uh, so looking forward, what are the reasonable expectations? Uh, I'm more of a conservative type of guy. So assuming only 1% of their customers come to us this year, knowing that 97.5% need it, assuming we only get 1%, we're looking at $2 million in revenue over the next year. Uh, we're maintaining a 60% margin, so we're looking at $1.2 million in profit, which we're going to put towards creating a new service to dominate the other side of this market and take over the entire home care industry this next year. Final slide. Uh, behind me, you see a list of 74 names that have helped me create this company. Uh, 42 of those names are faculty and alumni of Duke University. And for that, I'll always be thankful. Thank you. OK, so we have the results now. And so we're just waiting for the judges to come in, Sid. Bring them in. They're going to give some feedback. And then we're going to let them know, let you all know who won.
Just a couple of announcements uh, while we wait here. So uh, first, we want to announce uh, one of the other cash prizes. So our alumni track winner was Bungalow, a couple of Duke alums uh, who have started a company focused on renter's insurance. So congratulations to them. They won $10,000. And also uh, Smart Metals Recycling. So uh, Arun, Arun Karatu and Shelly Lee left Duke. Um, I'm sorry, Arun just graduated. Shelly left Duke uh, about a year ago. And they have started a company called Smart Metals Recycling. They already have $9 million in revenue this first year. And they are the winners of our Borchard Prize. So that's a $20,000 prize. So congratulations to Shelly and Arun. Now, yes, congratulations. Let's give them a round of applause. Okay, so uh, for those of you who are inspired tonight to think about starting your own company, the deadline for the next cycle of the Duke Startup Challenge is this uh, October 30th. And so please go to our website. There's a short idea summary template that you need to fill out, and you are welcome to apply. And don't forget, College Night at the American Underground is a great event to learn about the local startup scene. That's on October 7th. And this event is part of our Entrepreneurship Week at Duke University. Let's give a round of applause to everybody that's helped out with this fantastic week. OK, so Marie Angela, the winner of the Duke Angel Network and INE Task Force $2,500 prize is? Congratulations, sign on. Congratulations. Come on up here. We'll take a photo of you and the Blue Devil. All right, congratulations. All right. Congratulations. All right. All right. And as part of that, I will commit to connecting you to the Duke Angel Network Screening Committee, and we'll see uh, about the next steps there. OK, so uh, we're about to announce the winner of our $50,000 uh, Wicked Family Prize. Judges, I don't know if you all want to stand or if you want to just pass the mic around. But each judge is going to, each team that presented tonight is going to get uh, a little bit of feedback from the judges, and then we're going to announce the winner. So who's going to go first for Anderson? All right, so I've got the feedback for Anderson. Um, the, we loved the, the ambition of going for big problems um, that, that can really affect people's lives um, and, and the opportunity to bypass traditional infrastructure in developing countries the way that cell phones have bypassed landlines. Um, we we love that idea. Um, the, the problem that we had, uh, or the feedback that we have on that is that you should think a little bit more about, um, and pitching at least, the, the skilled maintenance model as well. I've, I personally saw a, few, a lot of um, great pieces of technology that were sitting idle in, in, in different parts in the developing world um, because of that need for maintenance and, and, and skilled labor taking care of them sometimes and, and understanding how that process will work once that gets in place. Um, that's kind of an important part of that vision that we were hoping to see that we didn't quite see there. So polish that up, and uh, we hope to see you continue on a great success. Yeah. Okay, so Sujan, Act Olivi, come on up here. Act Olivi. Yep. Um, we obviously understand that you sort of put everything together as fast as you could. Um, uh, the, I have to, we had to look at this and look at the feedback based on what we saw and what we heard. Um, based on this, um, I think the pitch needed to be a little bit more refined on the go-to-market strategy. When you're dealing with uh, an application that, um, you know, in a really crowded market, there's so many scheduling apps uh, out there, it's important to just say, you know, here's, here's what, you know, everyone else was doing, but we're doing it differently, and this is why users are going to take this, the value proposition. They're going to immediately, you know, understand this is where they need to go. Um, you know, less concerned about monetization, more concerned about, um, like, if you're saying your integration with API works this way, then that's what should have been the first thing. It's like, hey, you know, if, if you know, Open is integrated in this way, they just need to do one click and it's already there. Um, you know, just really sell that out um, in a way that then tells me, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm going to tell, I'm going to get my friend on this, I get this, because it has to be 
a almost a viral thing or else it just won't pick up. Um, so just a little bit more refinement there um, and how are you going to get that product. You went a little too deep on the actual usage of the product. Uh, it's more of on the higher level of getting the users there and how that is going to work around. All right. Yeah, drop by is watching via the live stream, so. Drop by, um, sure. Um, I actually thought very highly of drop by. Um, you know, the things that were raised are like, um, is it a, is a little too targeted on the focus? Um, I We all appreciate a focus in general, but that might be just really too targeted for a, a I know she was pitching the market, but we felt like it wasn't as big as she thought. Um, a lot of things on whether or not, like, is this a standalone product? It's almost like a feature that Zillow should be adding, um, or maybe a widget that could be added, and then why shouldn't they create it themselves? A little, a little bit of, like, is this really going to succeed in the marketplace? Um, but ultimately, I thought the pitch was very good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So I'm going to talk to Edge of Life. Edge of Life, yeah. come on up. Okay. Is my mic yeah, microphone's on? Okay. So we really liked your presentation. Your problem statement was really clear, you know, kind of hit home, which is always good in, your, in a pitch. Um, your, your presentation included lots of nice numbers, which investors always like and entrepreneurs should like too. Uh, we were impressed that you had 1.3 million users and you had the distribution through the schools. When Josh asked you his stumper question about uh, cell phone penetration or digital penetration, you had an answer, right? So you had lots of good answers. Uh, our concern area was with 1.3 million users, you didn't seem to be uh, getting a lot of revenue, right? And w that seems like a lot of users, which, uh, which is impressive for a startup to have lots of users, but you ought to be showing some monetization that, uh, until we felt like you could do stronger there. Obviously, uh, in the U.S., there's lots of companies that make boatloads of money teaching tests. Um, we've all paid them, so you're in a great space, and we wish you luck. Okay, great. Jake? All right, I'll be... Hello? Uh, I don't think that mic... Keep trying, Jake. Jake, it's Hello? Yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. Uh, hello. Uh, I think these uh, empty wrappers kind of speak for themselves. I <laughs> gobbled down six of those while I was watching. Um, <laughs> so, I, I, food businesses are hard. Um, and I think you've done a great job. I think the companies that are really going to be successful in this space, they understand that the, the future of food are foods that don't compromise. You know, we, we've had health food for a long time that just didn't cut it. You know, it's not good, so it doesn't really make it. And I think the foods that are going to be successful are ones that taste better than what came before them, are healthier for you. And a big third component is also the cost. People don't want to pay 10 times more for, for, for healthy food. So I think if you can dominate along those three categories, you can really be successful. I know that you've definitely gotten the taste. I think this product is great. I've never had raw food in my life, and I, I probably never will besides these. Um, <laughs> But the product's great. It tastes great. I think the ingredients, you made a great case there. Um, I think it'll be really great to see your traction when you get into these bigger retailers, to see the movement, to see if the price point is right. Um, but I wish you all luck. Thank you. Hi, Cannabis. Um, we loved your presentation. You spoke so confidently and directly to us. And it was really impressive what you've done. Um, I think your designs are incredible and the advanced nature of the business already selling and in production is really um, very, very good. We were really impressed. I think if we had longer, you probably would have answered these things, but the, the areas sort of of question a little bit were um, really just three. One was sort of the um, ardor with which you spoke about the non-leather and whether that really is an issue that you want to rally around and how much it really matters to your audience. Um, because leather is really popular for shoes and we don't know if that's, that's really something that people are going to get passionate about. Um, two was the price point, uh, $40. Sounded like a lot in India. Um, and maybe to that college audience that might want some differing price points. So maybe that's one price point but maybe you have alternate price points and some lower options, especially given that they're not leather. And then the third, and it might just be because a couple of us are older, um, was just the name. Um, 
No, and I know, and I read the story, and it makes sense because it's derived from the same, you know, plant uh, material. But at least for me, it was kind of a negative. Um, now, it might not be for everybody, and you'd have to do more research, and I'm not your target audience, I'm older than your target audience, but for a few of us, we said it wasn't necessarily a positive and could be a negative, so it's just something to think about. But really good job, very impressed. So I'd catch, um so, so first of all, again, um, this was a really strong presentation, well thought out, well put together. I liked the structure, how it flowed, and it, it really did answer a lot of the, the, the big questions. Um, I'd also say this is an obviously giant market, and microfinancing in, in a variety of different um, variations on that is really proven to have huge impact. So this is a, a very real space, and obviously a, a, a giant, giant uh, market where you can actually uh, build a big business, but also make a huge, huge impact, which is which is probably more important. Um, but um, I guess a couple of things that I would add, like to think through, or you probably haven't and just didn't have a, have time to walk through it. One is um, there are there is competition in this space, right? And there's a there's a large number of competition, and so being very specific about what it is that you guys do that others don't, and that could be from a technical perspective, that could be from just the the ground game that you have that's going to allow you to to drive that forward. Um, the second one, uh, just advice that I would have is um, shrink the market as small as you can. Sometimes when you have a giant market like that, at first it just becomes overwhelming. You can kind of get run over by the size of the market. If you can shrink it and then grow from there, I think that's going to be huge because it's going to allow you to have deep penetration and be able to measure and prove impact. Where I think a lot of uh, folks in this space are not able to kind of full circle it and give kind of quantitative views on it. If you do that, then it's, then it's game over. But it's really, really good. Hi. So your pitch definitely appealed to me. I've had, I had six cups of tea today. <laughs> I have like a whole little tea shop on my desk at work. I have a kettle and everything. So definitely get the value of tea. Uh, and I would love to spend time at the tea house. I mean, it definitely appeals. I can see the need to disconnect and, ha and it would be a very big differentiator in terms of from the coffee shop. So I think you definitely got that across. What what the, I think, what I didn't see in the pitch, which would have made it stronger, is to see a, a team um, with restaurant experience um, and also understand how your success at the farmer's market selling tea bags will translate into an actual shop where you're telling, selling cups of tea. And, and also just the business model, how is that just, what is what is the business model around that? And comparing it to the other competitors in the space uh, from a business perspective, like Tivana, how you're going to beat the other established tea players in, in the market. I think the other thing was um, to see how you will translate it from a single shop into a, a distribution uh, and build more credibility around doing that. And lastly, the the message around the, there was many, too many messages in the concept of one of a relaxing place to di disconnect uh, for around tea is very different from a yoga studio. Uh, and so there was just, it was, I think that was watering down the potency of, of just the tea shop itself. But uh, I think I really would like you to open in Durham, and you'll see me there. And <laughs> Raleigh. And Raleigh, Raleigh. You may become Raleigh instead. <laughs> I'll be giving the uh, feedback for Sinan. Um, so first of all, you have done a phenomenal job in uh, identifying, I think, a, a problem area as the aging population uh, grows in the world and as more and more people have um, neurological diseases. So the feedback to you is that you've identified a good market. It seems like you have really pushed this forward. You've actually come a long ways. but you didn't really give us a whole bunch on how, from a financial point of view, you will make money, um, licensing model, what, you know, you, you have a few good partners, and then you lost us when you said you're gonna exit, and you, and you heard that in the question. So 
I think that um, it's very important to show that, yes, there is going to be an exit, but um, don't, when people are getting emotionally attached to what you're saying, uh, don't, don't, let it, don't let us down so quickly. <laughs> Bye, Flex. So uh, you guys have such a noble mission, uh, you know, democratizing prescription eyeglasses in the world. I mean, it's a massive market. It's ownable if you, you know, get out there quickly. And so I was really impressed with the product. Uh, I think it would, you would have put it together a lot faster if you weren't nervous. <laughs> um, and so a lot of positives there. I think the two things that I, I had questions about, one is the business model. It didn't talk enough about that. How will you sell through NGOs? Are, you, are they buying it from you? Are they just, you know, how are they selling it? And is there another market there, like an Avon model for glasses? Um, the other is, is there, I, is there any IP that you guys are, are creating around the, the way the glasses function? Maybe there isn't. I don't think there has to be. I think if you get out there first and you have the right distribution channels, you can, you can own it. But all in all, like I was, you know, great, great job. Uh, it's surprising I haven't seen another, you know, another, a competitor that's going after the same market in the way that you are. So uh, good luck. And while we're getting Magdalena up here to announce the grand prize winner, let's give all of our competitors another round. Stay up here. Yep. Right here. And let's move you to the center, actually. Have one move this way. Take your, yep. Come on and over. Also, our judges for over. being here tonight and providing very valuable feedback. If we could give them a round of applause as yep. well. You know who the winner is? You do. So I guess that's the moment. Um, do we have a big check here? We do. It's me? right yeah. there. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Go it's ahead hiding and announce that. It and we'll, 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 we'll All show right. It. Um, so it was a. I must say it was really tough because we just were um, challenged to choose only one. And the nice thing is, when you're an investor, you don't just choose one. You make multiple investments. But tonight, it's only one. First of all, you guys are all winners. The reason why you came here tonight is because you put a ton of time and energy into this. And our advice to all of you is to keep doing it. Even if you don't get a check tonight, don't think that there was a disapproval. It was very hard to have to choose only one. But we did. And the reward goes to you. Sinan is the winner. <laughs> You guys off. We're gonna put the judges behind them. All right, judges, come on behind them. We're gonna take a photo with you behind them. All right, come forward here. Come on forward. Come forward. Good. Stop. Good in the middle. Thanks, everybody. Thank Have a great night.